wait another 10 seconds and then uh, and then we slowly start <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> let's, let, let's start. So good afternoon. <clears throat> uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione and I welcome you to this uh, fourth uh, lecture of our mini school on, uh, on, on quantum computing. As uh, probably all people attending know, our speaker is uh, Professor Daniel Park. Uh, he's based in, in South Korea at the Korean Advanced Institute for Science and, <clears throat> and Technology. And today's topic is quantum error correction. Yeah, and uh, and it will conclude these uh, four lectures, uh, mini school uh, on on an introduction to to quantum computing. So Daniel, I think every minute is precious. Uh, mm -hmm. Please, can I ask you to to share your screen and yes. and start with uh, with your presentation? And um, while you do that. I will remind again the, 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 the audience that they are welcome to ask questions using the uh, Q&A facility at the bottom of the, of the Zoom uh, screen. There is one, one button, yeah. And uh, uh, yes, that's it, wonderful. So we are in business. Thank you very much, Daniel, over to you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all again for having me today. And this is the last lecture of the mini school on quantum computing. Uh, so just to kind of, just to remind you, uh, the first week we discussed what is quantum computing and why we care about it. And then in the second week, uh, we discussed uh, how to, uh, we used quantum circuit as one example uh, of uh, of uh, quantum computing model to to realize the idea of quantum computation, and then in the last last week we uh, I I introduced some basic quantum protocols. Uh, so there we discussed uh, quantum teleportation and quantum super dense coding, and then I introduced uh, two simple quantum algorithms, uh, Deutsch-Joza algorithm and Simon's al algorithm. Um, okay, so uh, today is uh, the last lecture, as, as I mentioned, and then today we're going to see how to cope with error in quantum computation. Okay, and so why 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 is quantum error correction an important topic? Uh, I mean, so I, I had to pick uh, four topics, I mean, four hours uh, lecture, and I decided to spend like an hour, like one, uh, one quarter of it, just to discuss quantum error correction. So why is, why is this so important? Uh, it's important because uh, quantum computing is hard in practice. So, uh, quantum algorithms that we discussed last week uh, tell us that quantum computing could be useful for solving certain problems in theory, but you know that's a that's a theory. But we need really we need to be able to uh, make sure that these theoretical ideas are feasible in practice. Okay, uh, I mean any. Physical devices are uh, exposed to, to error, right? So, so I mean, classical digital computation could also have some noise. However, uh, it turns out that actually the uh, the the engineering uh, behind uh, classical digital computing is actually quite amazing. Um, they are actually very robust to noise. And so in classical computing, uh, I mean, in the, in the early, uh, in early times of classical computing, people had to think about uh, doing error correction also. However, uh, these days, these transistors are made to be so robust to noise that people don't really, 
I, I don't think people really implement quantum error correction uh, in, in classical digital uh, computing. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that in, in classical computing, we only care about uh, B-flip error, right? Because, I mean, the information is encoded as, uh, as bits of zero, zeros and ones, and the, the possible errors are, uh, you know, what's supposed to be zero happens to be one, and what's supposed to be one happens to be zero. So, like, uh, those type of B-flip error would uh, screw up the computation. But, you know, as I mentioned, it's, it's classical computing is really robust to such numbers. Uh, but in quantum case, we have to protect not only against B-flip errors, but also from the environment constantly in, interacting with uh, the, the quantum system. But also, at the same time, um, we also saw that uh, we need to uh, be able to like use entanglement and we need to be able to ma manipulate multiple qubits simultaneously and we want qubits to interact strongly and also accurately with uh, each other in the course of computation. Uh, so that's, that's, that's really hard because you know we want to kind of isolate our qubits from environment but we also want them to uh, interact with each other. So we have to make them very selectively uh, in interacting. And also, uh, when, you uh, when you, at first glance, uh, quantum computers look very much like classical analog computers. So in the beginning, I, I mentioned digital computer. But quantum computer, because when you, when you write down an arbitrary quantum state. Uh, it's actually, it's, it's uh, parameterized by two parameters, uh, as we saw last week. And these two parameters, theta and phi, they're, they, they're any complex uh, uh, numbers, right? And then we also saw that a quantum state could be defined on a block sphere. So, so it lives in this continuous space. So it seems like quantum computer uh, is very much like classical analog computers. And actually, uh, the problem, problem in analog computing, classical analog computing, is that, that we don't know how to do uh, error correction. And that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, we, we, uh, we use uh, digital computation with classical computers. Yeah, so, so at first glance, this seems problematic. And also, let's say, uh, if, the prob uh, if the probability of a, particular, of, of a gate to uh, successfully operate to be one minus P, right? Because, because we know for sure, uh, in practice, these gates won't be perfect, like 100%. There could be some error. But let's say uh, this is a success probability. Then after doing like n number of gates, the success probability uh, will reduce exponentially with uh, the number of operations that we do. So yeah, so we can already see many problems with uh, quantum computation. So before, um, yeah, so, so, um, so when uh, Peter Shore, he first came up with uh, Shore's algorithm for factoring, which I mentioned in, in the first lecture, I believe, uh, uh, people were skeptical about it because of these, because all, all the, these reasons. They, you know, many people thought it's, I mean, the, it's a nice algorithm, but it's uh, not going to be uh, it's going to be very difficult to realize it in practice. But then I think a year or two later, he came up with the idea of quantum error correction um, to, yeah, to kind of solve the problem. I mean, you know, there, there, there are so many, many open problems that I'll discuss later, but you know, 
he, he kind of uh, you know gave uh, the, the, he 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 built the foundation of the idea of quantum error correction. So before going into the details on quantum error correction, uh, let me introduce a another uh, formalism to uh, understand quantum mechanics. So in, in the week. One, we reviewed uh, quantum mechanics, and and back then we didn't really worry about noise, or like we didn't really worry about uh, interaction between uh, a quantum system of interest with some some noise environment. <clears throat> so remember, uh, we discussed that. Uh, quantum quantum states could be expressed as a uh, state vector. But now we're going to use a uh, density operator or, or density matrix. And it turns out that it's, it's mathematically equivalent to the state vector approach. Okay, So it will be useful for describing quantum systems whose state is not completely known. Okay, So let's imagine we have an ensemble of pure states. So we have some classical, some, some statistical mixture, right? So th there, is a, there is some probability associated with each uh, pure quantum state. Then we can define density matrix like this. So you see now we have, um, uh, this, is, this is a cat state, which is a column vector. And then this is going to be, um, complex conjugate of uh, this state vector. So this will be, so this is a state, uh, this is a column vector. This is gonna be row vector. So you multiply state vector, uh, sorry, column vector to row vector. So you get a, you get a, a square matrix, okay? Um, so if, if this density matrix we, we denote it by row, if this row is in this form, then there is only one possible state in the ensemble with probability one, right? So you just have only one state. So this is a pure state. But otherwise, we have a mixed state. So we have a classical statistical mixture of many pure states. Um, okay, and then also, I mean, the density matrix has to satisfy certain condition because the probability has to be non-negative and they have to sum up to one. Uh, okay, and also we can understand this density matrix in the block sphere as well. Um, so let's just limit our discussion to a single qubit. Um, and it turns out that this for poly matrices, they form a basis over a uh, real space. So any single qubit density matrix could be uh, written as a linear combination of these bases with some coefficient, and these are some real numbers. Okay, um, so when you're given any arbitrary state, single qubit state, this could also be written in this density matrix formalism in this form. And um, we can also geometrically understand uh, this density matrix as follows. So we remember we have a, a block sphere. And let's say psi one and psi two, these are two uh, pure states. They live on the surface of this block sphere. Okay. Remember, yesterday, uh, last week we we saw how uh, pure state could be described as a point on a block sphere. So now let's say if we have a mixture of these two, then it will be a convex combination of these two points. So we can draw we can draw a line, a straight line that connects these two, and. Um, the mixture of these two states would be on this line that connects these two. And maybe it's hard to, a little bit hard to see uh, in this like two dimensional picture, but 
really this block sphere is like three dimensional. So this point, remember these two points, these two pure states are on the surface of the block sphere. So when you make a convex combination of these two, uh, geometrically this point will be in the block sphere, okay? So when you have a pure state, it could be uh, expressed, it could be described as a point on a block sphere. But now when you have a mixed state, it could be described as a point inside the block sphere, okay? Uh, I think I have a question, so let, let me just check this question. Ah, okay, so the question is, why is the probability of success decreasing with an increase in the number of gates? Ah, it's very simple, you know, uh, let's say each gate uh, is only successful 90%, right? Like, let's say you have a 90% of success probability for a single gate, then you put two gates, and what's the probability of having both gates being successful? It's 0.9 times 0.9. So it will decrease. Because we were talking about the probability of the whole process being successful. Okay, I hope that answers the question. So if, if it's okay, I'll just continue. So, okay, so now uh, we saw how, at least for the case of single qubit, now what we saw is how to describe an arbitrary uh, single qubit quantum state. So it could be any states uh, on the block sphere or in the block sphere, okay? Uh, also, I mean, in the, in the week one, we, uh, we saw a unitary transformation as 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 as, uh, uh, as one of the uh, postulates of quantum mechanics to describe the dynamics of quantum states. Um, but we could uh, actually we could generalize a bit more, uh, and uh, we can really uh, define general quantum operation as follows. So you know it will be uh, a map that sends a density matrix to a density matrix, uh, okay? And uh, it turns out it has to be linear and it also has to preserve trace because the, the probability always has to add up to one. And it also has to preserve positivity because the probabilities has to be non-negative. And also there is this completely positive uh, condition. This is basically uh, saying that maybe, you know, our system is interacting with some unknown environment um, and we only have an access to this, this subset of the, the, the large system. And, and uh, even in, in that case, the probabilities always has to be non-negative. Okay, so that's a completely positive condition. <laughs> so, so any uh, any operation that uh, satisfies these conditions, can, so the so quantum operation has to satisfy uh, these conditions. And often you will see uh, people say like CPTP map, it's a completely positive and trace preserving uh, map. Okay, so these quantum operations could be, uh, described as three defined, like, you know, described with uh, three equivalent descriptions. So I'm using this lambda as a, as a quantum, in general quantum operation. And then as I just said, it has to be completely positive, risk preserving. Uh, equivalently, uh, a, an arbitrary quantum operation can be expressed as follows. So it could actually, it could be expressed as 
this equation and what this means is that uh, when you have like any you have some some quantum operation and it's actually equivalent to having some environment so this is some extra degree of freedom that we do not have access to and this this entire uh, system this this large system is evolving under unitary transformation but we are taking a partial trace over the environment meaning that we only have we don't have any access to the environment so we we only have access to the system okay um, and it turns out that this could also be expressed uh, as this linear uh, map and this a this is a row then some matrix again this this ai is some matrix uh, and it's it's not a unitary matrix but it just has to satisfy a certain condition and these are called a Krauss operator. So this is a Krauss representation of an arbitrary quantum map. Okay. Um, so, you know, so these three definitions are equivalent and actually like this definition, this also motivates the use of unitary circuits uh, because, you know, it turns out that we can we can describe we can express or we can we can simulate any arbitrary uh, quantum map using only unitary gates by introducing some environment in like appropriate way. Okay, so now uh, let's take a look at some some popular examples of uh, noise noisy channels noise maps. Okay, so one first one is depolarizing channel. You may have heard about this before. If I use a Krauss representation, it could be written as follows. But if we want to kind of visualize it, it's basically be visualized as uh, shrinking the block sphere. So, so let's say we have some pure state that's described on anywhere on the block sphere. And if we, uh, if this state undergoes depolarizing noise, then basically this state shrinks towards the center of the block sphere. Okay, so it could also be written as follows. Um, and it turns out that the, the center of the block sphere could be written as a unit matrix, a normalized unit matrix, meaning that this is a completely random state, 50% of being zero, 50% of being one. In, in classical sense, okay? So now uh, when you think about a quantum state going from the surface of the block sphere towards the center of the block sphere, uh, there is uh, this probability that your state will remain as it is, but there is some error probability. With, with some error probability, your state will become a random state. Okay, so this, this describes the process. Um, and it turns out this is actually quite important. So uh, for, any, uh, for any single qubit error, uh, the error can be, there, there are some techniques to, to actually transform any single qubit error to depolarizing error, okay? So this is really important because if, if our uh, we have a we have a quantum device that uh, they that that suffers only from single qubit error. Then it doesn't matter what type of error it is, it could always be transformed to depolarizing error. So as a error correction practitioner, you only need to come up with a way to correct for uh, depolarizing error. Okay. Uh, another popular noisy channel is dephasing. This is a Krauss map describing such process. Uh, you can also visualize it as a follow as follows. So you have some state vector pointing this way, 
um, but at time zero, but at some later time, uh, this will rotate around Z axis. Uh, but this noise around the Z axis, this rotation around Z axis is random. Okay. So at time, at some later time, it rotates around Z, but there is some sort of distribution. Okay. So when you take an average, if you calculate this, it turns out that uh, when you look at the, di uh, the density matrix, the diagonal terms do not change, but only the off-diagonal terms change and they, uh, uh, the, the, the quantities on the, the off-diagonal, uh, so these, these off-diagonal terms, they, they decrease exponentially with, uh, in time with some rate, T2. So you often also share the term uh, T2, T2 noise or T2. And so the, this, this T2 is the, the rate at which the off-diagonal terms decrease. We can, can uh, equivalently, we can look at the block sphere picture and it could be uh, uh, pictured as having a point on the block sphere. Then when it goes through this dephasing noise, uh, I mean, in, in, for the case of depolarizing noise, it shrank to a point in the center. But basically, when you have dephasing noise, it will shrink, but it will only shrink to, to a line that connects uh, zero and one, okay? So what does it mean? So we have some, some quantum state, but then after going through this dephasing channel, uh, it's along this z axis, so it just becomes some classical state. There is also uh, amplitude damping. So I didn't write down the Krauss opera operators for, for this noise, but, but you know it's it's quite straightforward to write them down, but I just didn't write them down here uh, because it's just better to see what happens to the density matrix. Um, and basically, uh, what this amplitude damping is about is that uh, given a quantum state, it will try to go to uh, the thermal equilibrium state. Okay. <coughs> so, um, by by convention. Uh, thermal equilibrium states are usually defined, usually like this z axis is defined to be, uh, um, sorry, this, this, this Pauli z operator is, is, is by convention defined uh, uh, as, a, as a quantization axis for, uh, for qubit. Um, Meaning, uh, meaning that this quantum state is defined, so the computational basis state is defined as a plus or minus one eigenstate of this sigma z. So thermal equilibrium state is usually defined along uh, this sigma z, uh, z axis. And when temperature is zero, it's just this point, or it could be anywhere along this line. So, you know, this picture is only showing the case when uh, the temperature is zero. So basically when you have a block sphere, if we, if this goes through amplitude damping, then the sphere will, ki will kind of uh, shrink towards this top, okay? Um, and, you know, you will see that you know, it's only going through this amplitude damping noise to, to go, it's, it's kind of tending back to thermal equilibrium state. But as it's doing that, also dephasing is, is happening because of that, right? And we use this T2 as a rate at which uh, this phase information is lost. And then usually, uh, and, and, and when there is only a purely amplitude damping noise, then T2 happens to be T2 times T1. Okay. 
Yeah, and you know, as we uh, as we if if we let the system evolve under uh, amplitude damping noise channel, then the limit of large T, then the the density matrix becomes the thermal equilibrium state. And this is often used for state initializations because you know if the temperature is really close to zero, then your thermal equilibrium state is almost, it's not perfectly pure state, but it's almost pure state at, at this point. So if we just let, um, let our quantum, so you know, we do some comp quantum computation. So basically the state evolves it will rotate uh, somewhere uh, around the block sphere. And then after we finish our computation, we want to reset. We want to reinitialize our quantum state for, for next algorithm or for next computation. Then we just let it sit under this amplitude damping channel for a while and it will basically eventually will go back to uh, this state. Okay. So now, uh, so these are some uh, popular noise in in many of the quantum devices that that we care about. Okay. Uh, okay. So now let's uh, discuss what error correction is about. So the goal of quantum error correction is to use redundancy. So this is really important that we use a redundancy and correct to, to realize, correction to realize logical qubits uh, with logical error rates below the error rate of the elementary constituent qubits. Okay. Um, so we just need to recall, if, if we recall this equation, maybe it may help a little bit to understand what's happening. So when you're given an arbitrary uh, quantum channel, um, this is not necessarily reversible because this is not unitary transformation. But we saw, by I said that any arbitrary quantum dynamic quantum quantum operation can also be expressed like this. Okay. So now if we if we're given some some noisy process acting on the density matrix of our interest. If we can uh, introduce some extra degree of freedom, which is redundancy here, such that this condition is satisfied for a given noisy channel, then now we can we can basically uh, reverse this unitary transformation of the entire system. Okay, then basically we get rid of these unitaries, and then we only have access to this one, but it doesn't really matter. But we because we we after we we uh, reverse these unitaries and we trace out the environment, and then we are back to our density. Okay, so really that's, uh, that's the essence of quantum error correction. You need to use some redundancy such that uh, this noise, noisy process could be re reversed. Okay, so how people do it in classical computing? I mean, I mentioned that you know, we, classical computation, digital computing, they, they do not use error correction anymore, but the, you know, the idea of error correction is very mature in computing, so we can maybe borrow some idea from, from there, okay? And they also use redundancy, okay? So as an, as an example, let's say we have two classical bits uh, that we want to transmit or communicate, but then uh, this communication channel is noisy, so this zero will remain zero with success probability one minus p, but this zero could flip to one with some probability p and vice versa. Then what we can do 
is instead of sending only one bit, we encode this information in three bits. Okay, so instead of using zero to represent zero, we use zero, zero, zero to represent this value. And we use one, one, one to represent this value. Okay, uh, then uh, our uh, rule is to use majority vote after uh, the error channel. So if the noise is not so strong, then out of the three bits, maybe only one of them will flip, okay? So we see we, after these three bits go through some noisy channel, we take a look at them. We take a majority vote, most of them are zero. So okay, so it was probably zero, 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 but one of them happened to flip because of the noise. And if these were the outcomes, and we can say, yeah, okay, maybe this was just one, 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 but maybe one of them flipped just because of there was some small error. Okay, so if we uh, do that, then this is a probability of having no error, this is a probability of having one error, this is a probability of having two errors, and this is a probability of having three errors. So uh, by taking the majority vote, uh, these two cases are not prob problematic anymore. No error, this is good. If there was one error, then we use majority vote to correct for it, okay? So these are the only two cases that we cannot uh, compensate, okay? But what's the probability of these two cases? It turns out that it's uh, the probability to fail is now changed from just P to this value. So when we compare these two numbers, this is actually an improvement as long as P is less than one half. And of course we can add more bits, meaning more redundancy to correct more errors, okay? But you know, quantum, case is not as simple. Um, okay, I think there is, an, there is a question, so I'll try to... Uh, so the question is, I wonder why until now we don't have a real quantum computer. Uh, the answer is we do have real quantum computers, but you know, the number of qubits we can manipulate with uh, High precision is not that many, um, but there, 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 there are quantum computers. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So now quantum error correction is not as straightforward as classical error correction because first of all. In classical error correcting code, we saw we in the end we 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 take a look at our bits and we take a majority vote, but we cannot do that because measurement destroys superposition. And also, you know, uh, we, uh, in classical computing, you copy the bits, right? If it was zero, then you copy zero. So you make zero to zero, zero, zero. If the information was one, then you, you make one, one, one. So you have to be able to copy an arbitrary uh, input bit. But we discussed last week that uh, an arbitrary copying is not possible due to no cloning theorem uh, in quantum mechanics. And also, um, in quantum computing, as I mentioned earlier today, we have to be able to correct multiple types of error, not only before error, but there could be like some phase error as well. And also, we, also, we, we saw that quantum computing looks very much like uh, classical analog computing, so the error could be continuous. Error. So you have to be able to correct for uh, continuous errors, okay? Uh, but it turns out that actually, you know, in the slide before, uh, the measurement seemed to be a problem because that uh, destroys superposition. But also it turns out that, you know, the measurement could be used to digitize this continuous noise. 
Okay, uh, so I'm just going to kind of go a bit fast. Uh, but basically what I have written here, so you, you can maybe uh, look at this in detail later uh, once I share my slide. But let's say this is a system of interest. It's attached to some unknown uh, environment. So this is a degree of freedom that we do not have an access to. So this goes through some arbitrary um, transformation like this. So, so some arbitrary transformation can be written like this. And also, let's say our system of interest was one attached to, to some environmental degree of freedom. Then let's say uh, some arbitrary transformation can be written like this, okay? Then by linearity, when you're given an arbitrary proposition of zero and one, uh, uh, after this noisy process, uh, we can kind of just uh, write down uh, the, the outcome. And it turns out that the state could be spent like this. Okay, so uh, when we trace out the environmental degree of freedom, uh, the state will collapse to one of these four different cases. So this means that um, we need to, we only need to worry about uh, how to correct this poly. Uh, noise, okay? Um, yeah, so um, when we design quantum error correcting code, we, we make sure that a subset of these poly errors can be detected. So that will be the strategy. Okay, let's uh, take a look at some example. Uh, so this would be a smallest code. So remember uh, in classical error correction, uh, you need three bits at least. So it's the same for quantum error correction. If you want to correct for a, a certain type of error, so in this case, a bit flip error. So this is not an arbitrary error. So it's a specific, specific case of error. So when there is a single qubit bit flip error, we can use three qubits to correct for it. So this is a state that we want to protect, can be written as an arbitrary proposition of zero and one. We introduce two extra qubits and we apply some C naught to encode, right? So after we do encoding, this is the state that we get. This is a logical qubit. So you see this zero, zero, zero is logical zero. This one, one, one is the logical uh, one. Goes, this goes through some noisy channel. And after that, we will decode. Um, then it turns out that this resulting state. So here in this noisy process, any of these three uh, possibilities could happen. So first, maybe there is no error. Second, maybe one qubit flips or two qubits flip or three, all three qubits. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, so this is a uh, first qubit flips. So this means the second qubit can flip. This means the third qubit could flip. Because we only worry about, so for now, we're only looking at the single qubit bit flip error. So these are four possible states, right? But now when you look at, when you look at this environment, environmental, no, the ancillary uh, degree of freedom, uh, you see this resulting state has become one of these four uh, with uh, one of those poly operators applied to, the system, to our qubit of interest. And this is the only case uh, when uh, actually like a non-trivial Pauli operator has been applied to the quantum state. So in this case, we measure these two qubits. That's completely fine because these were some extra degree of freedom. So if these were 0, 0, 1, 0, or 0, 1, we just don't do anything. But if this was 1, 1, then we apply x 
uh, gate to, uh, to remove this operation. And in error correction, often this information is also called error syndrome. So you see, um, we have used some redundancy, but we actually have not copied the state because this is not three copies of sign. Okay. And also, we uh, we did not uh, measure the data directly, but we uh, came up with a way to measure the error, right? So because now we did not, we have not, you see like by doing this, we're not gaining any information about the Psi itself. So because we're not gaining any information about Psi, we, this, kind, this means that we did not make any measurement. So we, we are not really destroying this state. So uh, what about the phase flip error? So just now we only saw B flip error. Um, then maybe I'll just go a little bit quick. We basically use the same circuit, but if we use Hadamard gates, so, so maybe uh, for those of you who do not remember what Hadamard gate was, this was the gate that creates uh, an equal superposition state if you're given a computational basis state. And also if you're given a, uh, an equal superposition state, it, you apply Hadamard gate to go back to computational basis state. And in, in poly matrix language, this means that you can change sigma z to x or you can change sigma x to sigma z. So what's happening here, remember uh, the noise here, that we looked at was a B flip error, which is written as a poly X noise. But now um, maybe some phase error, which is expressed as a poly uh, Z error. Then now we have Sigma Z operations here, but by using Hadamard gates, this error becomes Sigma X. So we can just use the same circuit that we used for correcting for sigma x to, uh, to correct phase flip error. And the logical qubit is written like this. So, uh, so far we looked at two quantum error correcting codes that can correct either a B flip error or phase flip error, but not both. However, as I mentioned, um, the error could be B flip error or phase flip error, and we don't know which is happening. So we need to design an error correcting code that can correct for an arbitrary single qubit error. And that's what uh, Shore came up with. Uh, and he came up with a nine qubit error correcting code to, uh, to correct any arbitrary single qubit error. And the idea is to uh, first, uh, you know, you're given a state that you want to protect, you encode into three qubits so that it will correct for uh, Z error, phase flip error. Then um, now we kind of, you, 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 it's called code concatenation. So first you, in, you use uh, some error correcting code to correct for Z error. And now you you concatenate you you encode further, so you encode each three qubits, each set of three qubits into uh, error correcting code such that it also corrects for uh, x error. So because of that, now we have nine qubit error correcting code. Okay. Um, however, so is is nine qubit really the uh, the, the, the necessary is, is nine really the necessary number for correcting for single qubit error? The answer is no. So later people uh, figured out that it turns out you need five qubits to correct for any arbitrary single qubit error, okay? Um, I'm going just to, I'm just gonna go, I'm, kinda, I'm, go, I'm going to skip this slide. It's just saying we can also correct for small continuous error. Okay, so uh, so far 
we saw, so we, uh, I mentioned there are these problems, but you know, I also showed you, uh, you know, people came up with ways to, to solve these problems, okay. Um, okay, that's good, but that's not the end of the story. Why is that? Because uh, we want to implement error correcting code which requires extra qubits and extra gates. But you know, the error correcting code that we uh, discussed so far uh, assumed that these extra gates that we introduce are perfect. But you know, any realization will suffer from imper imperfections, right? So this encoding and decoding themselves could be noisy in practice, right? So actually there is no guarantee that quantum error correction can help us as, as you know, perhaps by uh, trying to, when we try to implement error correcting codes, maybe they just introduce more errors, right? So we just have to make sure that the error that we introduce by using more gates and more qubits is less than the error that we can remove by implementing these error correcting codes, okay? So that's, uh, and that's where the idea of the theory of fault tolerance comes in, okay? Um, so what we want is that now let's go back and uh, think about the, uh, the workflow of, of quantum computation. So we have to do some state preparation and we have to do the state transformation and then we have to do measurement. And any of these processes could be vulnerable to error. So we have to do all of this fault tolerantly. So we have to do error correction fault tolerantly and, and everything. So things get uh, quite uh, complicated. Uh, but you know, um, people worked very hard to, to, to solve these problems. So one way of achieving fault tolerance is to concatenate codes, okay? So the idea is as follows. So we have a logical qubit, which consists of many qubits, right? So we use many qubits as a redundancy to encode uh, uh, a single qubit information. Then, then these qubits can also be encoded into more qubits. So we can go down the layers until the very uh, last layer would really be the physical qubits, okay? So if we do level one, the error probability goes from P to some constant times P, P to the square. And then we can kind of concatenate this. And then what we see that you see, like if we want to use this concatenation, we're, use, we're actually using exponentially many number of qubits. So of course the number of gates will also increase exponentially. However, when you look at the error, the, uh, the error rates will decrease double exponentially. Okay, as long as this, prob this error probability at the physical layer is less than some threshold, less than some value. So this C is some constant, okay? So as long as the physical, the, the, the error rate, a physical layer is less than some value, then um, we can reduce the error exponentially uh, with respect the, to the extra resource. So this is very efficient, okay? Okay, so, uh, so this leads us to uh, the fault tolerance threshold theorem. So it basically says that, I mean, this is basically repeating what I uh, showed you in the previous slide, but basically there exists a threshold error probability such that if the error rate per gate at the physical layer, n times that is less than this threshold value, then we can use uh, this error correction to achieve arbitrarily uh, long quantum computation, okay? So that's very nice. 
but there are also there still remains challenges. Okay, so this concat concatenated codes have some practical issues still, such as they require long distance interaction among qubits. So when you really think about design uh, making quantum device, uh, you know uh, the layout is really uh, it has to be some some physically feasible layout, and you know you you, you put some qubits in, in in some physical layout, and then you have to make sure that that the qubits that they are far away could also interact. Uh, from uh, to to one another, so that could be a little bit challenging uh, from the hardware uh, point of view, and also you know a level of concatenation will increase the resource exponentially. I mean, at the cost of, I mean, this will really doubly exponentially decrease the error rate. So in terms of the computational complexity, it's it's efficient. However, um, maybe maybe there are cases where we we don't really have to decrease the error too much, right? Maybe I mean we just want to decrease the error a little bit. Uh, but you know, these concatenated codes, it will in some situations it will unnecessarily decrease the error too much uh, at the cost of having a uh, large resource overhead, okay? So there are some, uh, some challenges. So to, uh, to circumvent these problems, topological error correcting codes, for example, maybe you've heard surface code uh, has been uh, invented to solve these issues. But you know, this is another uh, topic we can dis discuss for hours. So I, I want, I'm not going to discuss this in detail, but you can, uh, you know, so, so now you kind of, you at least uh, heard this term and then you know where this, like what motivates this. Okay. Um, okay, so what have we uh, discussed so far in this mini school? Sorry, uh, so we, uh, so I, uh, I told you that uh, there are two theoretical pillars for quantum computing. One is quantum algorithms, which tells us uh, that quantum, quantum computing could be useful. And another um, pillar is, that is quantum error correction that tells us that uh, the imperfections of hardware is not the fundamental problem in the development of uh, quantum computing. And uh, I mean, the, the main focus of this mini school was uh, theoretic, theor theoretical aspects of quantum computing. So we did not discuss quantum hardware, but of course we, uh, we really need to work very hard to, uh, to come up with quantum hardware to, uh, to be able to uh, realize these beautiful uh, theoretical ideas. Uh, let me quickly mention some of the uh, necessary conditions uh, for quantum hardware. So now maybe, hopefully these, these sound uh, obvious to you. But you know, first of all, we need to have a scalable physical system with well characterized qubit. Uh, so, so these are the things that that one should consider when you when you think of using a particular a specific physical system for quantum computing. And also, there has to be some way to initialize the state of qubit to a, some simple state to to start the computation. And the relevant uh, decoherence time has to be much longer than gate operation time. So this means that uh, before we lose quantumness, uh, we need to be able to apply as many quantum gate. We we need to be able to multiply many quantum gates before we lose quantum nature. 
due to the the undesirable uh, due to the this unwanted uh, interaction with the environment. We need to be able to do universal universal set of gates, and also we need the qubit specific measurement capacity. Um, these two conditions are more specific to quantum communication, so I can skip for now. So, um, you know, actually there are many physical systems that, behaves, that behave quantum mechanically. So there are some systems in nature, uh, of course, but, you know, uh, you can also make some devices that, that, that exhibit uh, quantum behaviors, okay? Uh, okay, so uh, you already saw this picture, so where are we now? So roughly in terms of the number of qubits and in terms of, of uh, error rate at the physical layer, we are roughly here, uh, but soon, um, so, so you see, we are not quite there to be below error correction threshold. So probably for now, it would not be so useful to implement uh, quantum error correcting codes because the noise is too, too high. But uh, it seems very uh, optimistic that we will, in the near future, will be in this regime uh, from, I don't know, like 100 to 1,000 qubits. Once we go to this era, this is also called noisy intermediate scale quantum era, uh, it will be very difficult for classical computing to simulate the behavior of the quantum, of quantum computers in this era. But, you know, uh, still, if we want to be able to implement some useful quantum algorithm in a fault tolerant way, for example, let's say we want to implement Shor's algorithm to, uh, to decrypt uh, this RSA code, like, you know, 1024-bit RSA code. Um, uh, such problem is something that we, we really would worry about. Uh, for a quantum computer to do such task, we really need to go like, like millions of qubits, with uh, less than 0.1% error rate. So that's still uh, far in the future, but uh, we are hopeful uh, that we will make uh, some slow progress to, to reach there. And of course, uh, in, in this journey, we'll of course come up with many more interesting uh, problems and new findings. Okay, uh, I want to just end, I'm going to end uh, with the, the final slide uh, that I, I often show. So this is, this you're seeing the, the blackboard of uh, Richard Feynman at uh, his, uh, after he uh, passed away. So this is uh, what's believed to be his, his blackboard, his last blackboard. And he said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So this, maybe we can uh, turn it around a bit and we can interpret this as, uh, the, as, as the following. So maybe the reason that we do not have a scalable uh, universal quantum computing, quantum computers is maybe because we just do not we still do not have a uh, full under understanding of, of uh, these quantum systems. And, and perhaps uh, by uh, trying to build these quantum devices, it will help us to really expand our understanding uh, about uh, the quantum wo world. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'll just end here and I'll take questions. And I think there is already a question. Yeah, there is one. And it's, how does the summary Kitaev theorem affect quantum error correction? Um, so, I'm not sure what you mean, because uh, Solovey uh, Kitaev theorem just says 
uh, how uh, when you want to achieve universality uh, using a universal set of gate, how does the error in the approximation of unitary transformation scales. So I'm not sure what, so I, I, I have feeling that this is two separate problems, but maybe, um, yeah, I'm not so sure what this question is about, but what I can say is that, um, you see, you know, you, you have a universal set of gates that will allow us to approximate an arbitrary uh, unitary transformation. And Solvay Kitaev uh, theorem tells us that the, the error uh, in, in, in that approximation scales, um, uh, it will, it will decrease very fast, right? Um, uh, at, least, at least for a single qubit. Um, but now uh, when you do error correction, you have to be able to do those universal set of gates fault tolerantly. So once you can do them fault tolerantly, then that's, that's fine. So it, it's really the matter of can you, is there an efficient way of doing this universal set of gates uh, fault tolerantly? And the answer is yes, there are. Yeah, Dan, ah, the, the, is there another question? Yeah, the, yeah. The, it looks like one more question, Ilya. Sorry, just popped up. Yes, uh, I think, yeah, yeah, the question is when, when you were explaining the phasing channel, I noticed that you were using. 3D X Y Z, but in CPT expression you were using Z Y. Ah, it's uh, X Y Z. I mean X Y Z. I was just showing the block sphere. Uh, but the dephasing error means that uh, it will uh, destroy only the Z component of your state. Sorry, so not not Z component. Uh, uh, X Y component. So your Z, uh, your Z components will not be affected. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, I'm not sure, it doesn't look like there are any more uh, questions. Maybe since it is the the last lecture we can offer the, the, the one or two participants to raise their hand and, and ask the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, it could be, it could be anything um, from the, the past four lectures. It does not have to be yes, specific yes, to this yeah. one. No, it would be nice to get um, maybe uh, a real question from, from the audience, since we are not uh, hundreds, ah, yeah. uh, it, it's, it's quite manageable. So please ra raise your hand and I can give you the permission to, uh, to, to, to talk and, and pose your question yourself, if you are interested. Okay, the, our audience uh, seems to have understood everything perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel and doesn't come up with uh, with, with questions. So um, then it's um, just up to me to, to 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 thank you really very much, Daniel, for your for your time and uh, and effort. Ah, here you see, you just need to to start something and hear the questions come. Um, ah, so uh, okay, uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, uh, no, no, oh, Daniel, please, but maybe share the questions with everybody because, um, yeah, they might not see it, yeah. So the question is how the unitary gates, so this, this again relates to the question about uh, how Solovey-Kitaev uh, theorem relates to quantum error correction. And the question is how the unitary gates can be implemented fault tolerantly 
So I, I, I mentioned there is a way, but um, maybe you want to know a little bit more uh, specific. So it's actually very complicated. So it will take lectures to understand how to do it. And it really also depends on the code that you're using. So if you're using the five qubit uh, minimum, so the minimum, so I mentioned the five qubit is the minimum that you need. And actually it turns out that people don't really use it because when you're doing the five qubit error correcting code, then it's actually very hard to do the uh, uh, fault tolerant gates. So what people do typically is a seven qubit code. Uh, and when you're doing seven qubit code, at least it's really straightforward to do uh, Clifford operations. Uh, meaning, it's, for example, like C0 and Hadamard gates. So uh, fault tolerantly. So for example, when you have, a, uh, when you have a two blocks uh, of, uh, so let's say for seven qubit code, so there will be 14 qubits you need to have two logical qubits, right? You need seven for each logical qubit. And let's say you want to do uh, a, a logical C0 operation between two logical qubits, right? Then what you do is that it turns out that if you just do a C0 gate uh, between each pair of physical qubits within these two blocks of code, uh, logical uh, qubits, then it turns out that it's equivalent to doing uh, logical C0 in a fault tolerant way. So that's like one example. Um, but, uh, and also like you can do Hadamard gate in a similar way. You just do Hadamard on all 14 qubits and it turns out that it's equivalent to, to doing uh, a logical Hadamard gate. But then um, it's actually not so trivial to do, it turns out that it's actually not possible. It's not even possible to do a universal fault tolerant uh, computation only using uh, one type of error correcting code. So, so now what you have to do is you have to uh, use another type of error correcting code. So there is like a 15 qubit error correcting code and there uh, it's more straightforward to apply certain gates, some, some non clifford gates, mm, uh, fault tolerantly. So now you have to like concatenate the seven qubit code with the 15 qubit code to be able to uh, achieve uh, uh, fault tolerant universality. So that's one way of doing it. And there is also another way of doing it uh, uh, and it's called a magic state preparation. And the idea is actually very similar to this measurement-based quantum computing that I introduced in the week two and week three. Um, so, uh, so what happens is that if you, you are able to prepare a specific states, if you're given a specific input states, some very special input states that are called magic state, then just by doing a uh, Clifford gate, you can achieve universality. So Clifford gate itself is, does not guarantee you universality, but if you're given a magic state, then you can do that. So now you can just use a seven qubit code where you can do the Clifford gates, and then you just needed a way of the ability to prepare this magic state. Then you can also achieve uh, universality for tolerantly. However, now how, how do you uh, prepare this magic state? It's, it's, you know, it, it, you, you can do it, but it also has some, some resource overhead and so on. So, I mean, there are ways, uh, and it, that's possible, but it takes, you know, you, you, have, there, you have to uh, do some really like study in depth to really understand all, all of this. Yeah, Daniel, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, I think you, you, you mentioned that um, some questions require an, another course to be answered. Yeah? <laughs> and, uh, 
And uh, MAB, you know, I just, I, I would just like to share that uh, the, the intention of this uh, specific mini course was just an appetizer in quantum computing. Yeah? And, and in future, we can organize um, <clears throat> other courses, other schools on a more specific topic. Yeah? And maybe we will ask uh, Daniel again to give us a mini school on mm -hmm. quantum error correction so that we can maybe go into details a, a, a little bit deeper, but we will plan it. Uh, in, um, in, in, in due course. So Daniel, again, thank you so much for your, for your time and for the, for the very nice lectures. <clears throat> and thank you to Ilya for the moderation of the questions. And of course, thank you very much to all the, all the participants for being so, so loyal till the very end. We still had almost 40 people today after four lectures, which I think is probably very good. And, um, and we will see you again next month, where we will <clears throat> start a new mini school on, on, on particle physics. But we will send out the announcements uh, in just now. Yeah. So thank you very much again, Daniel. Have a good evening in, in South Korea. And uh, we are hope to see you all again next week, including Daniel. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah, bye, bye. 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 Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.